We take digital communication for granted. We use the internet daily and for an increasing number of tasks. But what if we could reimagine how we communicate with each other? Today, we've built a proof of concept for a new peer-to-peer -peer wireless communication network that takes a different approach to a modern age problem. We'd like to present LoraCrypt. LoraCrypt has several key features that set it apart from common communication mediums. LoraCrypt is fully encrypted, highly resistant to interference, uses less power than similar mediums, can transmit up to 15 miles, is highly censorship resistant, and can run on a handheld portable device. LoraCrypt was created when we stopped to reconsider our dependence on infrastructure to communicate with each other. Exploring our options, we realized that the LoRa radio protocol was perfect for us. LoRa, literally long range, occupies an unlicensed 915 megahertz band and uses a modulation technology called Chirp Spread Spectrum. CSS is what allows our project to have high resistance to interference and low power requirements due to the unique way it sacrifices data transmission rates by utilizing the entire allocated frequency. With this, we think our system could help in three distinct cases, off-grid communication, political activism, and emergency response. Users who are camping could carry a small portable device with them, allowing them to send secure messages with low power requirements, possibly charging with a tiny solar cell. Similarly, users who live in rural areas could use our protocol to communicate with family or friends, regardless of what infrastructure is available in their area. If a user is experiencing censorship or otherwise needs anonymity, our protocol is perfect for that. Since the network is decentralized, users can send fully encrypted messages to anyone within range, while still being entirely anonymous. And finally, in the case that a natural disaster or other catastrophe disabled or interfered with broadband internet, power, cell service, LoraCrypt could prove to be resilient and enable low power communication between family members looking to coordinate evacuation or between emergency response professionals seeking a redundant form of communication. This is especially useful for those of us who live in the Pacific Northwest, where a large earthquake poses the risk of a long-term power or internet blackout. We think we've created something really interesting here, and we are excited to share the details about how we designed and built LoraCrypt. Before we go into the design, however, we should go over the goals for this project. In terms of function, we had three main goals, creating the software needed to operate the transmission hardware, creating a human usable interface for the system, and creating a system for the encryption and decryption of messages. Out of these three, encryption and decryption deserves a bit more detail, as that is a fairly amorphous goal. More specifically, our goal for encryption was for only the sender and receiver to be able to decrypt a message, and for other actors not to be able to impersonate a valid sender, modify a valid message in such a way as for it to remain valid, or resend a previous message in such a way as for it to remain valid. These three functionality goals are also fairly distinct, allowing each to be accomplished by a largely separate system. LoraCrypt is designed to be a highly modular set of tools, and as such, we've divided it into discrete layers. These layers all live on our transmission device, an Adafruit Huzzah 32 microcontroller connected to a LoRa transmitter. At the lowest level, we have what we call the send and receive layer. The send and receive layer is essentially a driver between our microcontroller and the transmitter itself. It handles individual packet transmission to an arbitrary destination. Above that, we have the transmission layer. This layer adds a way to reliably send many packets, requiring that the receiving board acknowledges each packet sent and also handles the retransmission, analogous to the TCP layer in the internet that we are familiar with today. However, our version has a bit less overhead. Then we have the encrypt and decrypt module. This is a standalone component that does most of the heavy lifting by exposing functions to encrypt and decrypt arbitrarily large buffers of data, which is what we end up sending over LoRa. While our project was focused on providing these lower level functions that I just talked about, we also implemented two example applications which demonstrate how we think LoraCrypt could be used. First, there is Serial API, which runs on the microcontroller and allows for a paired computer to work as a human-readable command line interface. Built on top of Serial API, we also have File Transfer, a Python script that allows you to send and receive any type of file over LoRa channels. We'll be demonstrating how both of these work at the end of the video. First, I want to talk about the Send and Receive layer. While this code was some of the most important to get right, we thankfully had a library called Radiohead. 
which drastically simplified our job by handling all the LoRa encoding functions and abstracting it away into a simple package structure. When we use the send and receive layer, our data is wrapped with some headers, thanks to Radiohead. And the most important piece of these headers is the address section, the ID of the device sending the message and the ID of the intended recipient. This helps us to implement some reliable sending features and also allows for rudimentary addressing, which can be used for other additional features later on. These headers also include some important data for the transmission itself, including a preamble to ensure proper demodulation, and some CRC bits, which if you're unfamiliar work as an error detecting code, allowing us to resist even more interference. Next, I want to briefly touch on the transmission layer. Built on top of these simple send and receive functions, the transmission layer implements a protocol that allows for two devices to establish a connection and ensure delivery of all packets. To open a connection, the sender will send an initialization request to a receiver, including the number of bytes they want to send and a random ID representing this communication session. If the receiver accepts their request, they will send an acknowledgement and the sender will begin to send packets. Since LoRa is a single channel communication medium, the sender will broadcast a single packet at a time and then clear the channel to wait for the receiver to acknowledge by sending an ACK. If packets are lost, the sender knows to retransmit them and up to a configurable number of retries per packet. If this threshold is not passed, all packets will eventually be sent and the connection will be at the end mutually terminated. Finally, the serial API layer is the last piece of low level code. It allows us to connect the microcontroller to a computer with a USB connection to send and receive information over serial. In our current implementation, we've balanced the commands and responses to make this human readable while also using as few characters as possible, which allows us to both use the API directly as if it was a command line itself, while also using it for automated scripts like our file transfer program. Now that you've heard Max talk about the serial portion of lower crypt, Let's talk about the portion of the project that deals with the encryption and decryption. In particular, this portion is split into two key objects, one that manages keys and one that actually does the encryption slash decryption. First though, we need to configure some things. A user, whether that be an individual or an implementer in another project that uses our own, uses a configurable object to define what sort of encryption they want. Right now, this takes the form of choosing the hash function to authenticate with and what block cipher to actually encrypt with. Users create both the function and the cipher, and then dependency inject them into the configuration. This way, users can choose the level of security they need, weak or non-existent in certain low-importance cases, strong in others. They'll also get an opportunity to adjust the specific settings that are unique to the library implementation. Next, the user must create the secret key. This encryption model is symmetric, so both users on opposite ends of the process, send and receive, must use the same secret key. This is done by creating the key manager object. This class takes an inputted password string and uses the hash function in the configuration to generate the secret key. It can then expose the said key to later parts of the pipeline and destroy the key on its own destruction. The use of the hash function here is to ensure that the key is long enough for later use by a cipher. Both the key manager and the config are then passed into the next step, the encrypt object. So the main class we're using is the encrypt object. This is in charge of both encrypting and decrypting the bytes. The encrypt object is split into two main functions, the encrypt and the decrypt classes. And injecting the configuration and the key management object will of course tell it how to encrypt and what key to use respectively. Let's talk about both of these things one by one. First, the encrypt method. This method essentially encrypts any amount of plain text into a authenticated ciphertext. First, the user will input a plain text, a randomly generated IV, as well as the length of the plain text. Within the method, it would then check that all fields are valid, that is to say that the key stored in the key manager will suffice, that the hash function will work, and then uh, encrypts the actual plain text with the cipher into the cipher text, and then generate the HMAC or the authentication code off of that cipher text. It'll then output the HMAC, the cipher text, and whatnot into some pointers. For decrypt, on the other hand, it's the opposite. One would provide the intake in ciphertext, the intake in HMAC, as well as the intake in IV, as well as the length of the message. All these things would be passed in through serial. First, a key check is a, a key check just like encrypt occurs, and then the HMAC is recreated from the ciphertext and then verified with the inputted HMAC. This means that 
Users on both ends, the sender they receive, must be using the same hash functions. After the HMAC is verified, if it doesn't verify properly, it'll fail early. Then the ciphertext can then be decrypted into the plaintext and then output it through the pointers. Let's talk now about the security goals and guarantees our system has. First up, let's talk about the keys. The goal throughout is to ensure that the secret key access is minimized. It's important in symmetric authentication that the key is not revealed too often, is not stored on disk for too long, etc., etc., because it's essentially hard stored there. Our system tries our best not to store the secret key for too long. Every time the object is initialized, it has to be recreated by inputting a password. Of course, a third-party program using our library could store the password somewhere else. The secret key is also designed to never leave the board that LoraCrypt runs on. Getting information on the key, on the password or the key on an Arduino board while it's being actively flashed and used is, while not necessarily securing a formal sense, certainly a very difficult task. So we're relying on a bit of inherent hardware difficulty here to offer some security. Next, let's talk about the specific encrypt then Mac format we're using. There are several different formats, you, protocols you can use. Encrypt then Mac, Mac then encrypt, and Mac and encrypt. We choose encrypt then Mac because it seemed to offer the most overall security. In particular, encrypting first and then macking, and vice versa, verifying the HMAC before actually doing decrypting protects us from certain potential attacks. In particular, uh, ciphertext integrity and indistinguishability under adaptive chosen ciphertext, NCCA and NCTX. Along with that, randomly generating the IV outside of the encryption process means that our cipher, often for example, CTR, has NCPA security as well. Our encryption doesn't cover all security issues, however, and some of the issues it doesn't cover we won't be addressing at all. Most of these issues are inherent to any wireless communication and leave us no feasible way to address them, while others are unaddressed due to limitations in our own skills and resources. The first inherent security issue is that due to our use of omnidirectional wireless broadcasts on a known channel, finding a transmitter is relatively easy. If an attacker can measure the signal strength at three different points, they can triangulate the location of the transmitter. Our application does partially mitigate this by only transmitting when there is a message to send, which in many applications will mean transmitting in infrequent short bursts that could be difficult to track. But the general problem remains largely unsolved by us. Another limitation of broadcasting on a known channel is that an attacker can perform a denial of service attack by filling the LoRa band using a stronger transmitter, so that our transmitters will not be able to communicate through the noise. We haven't addressed this issue at all as we don't know of any way to do so. We also aren't experienced enough in this field to avoid hardware side channel attacks, which almost certainly exist on our boards. But we don't know how to find them, and if we did, we wouldn't know how to fix them, so they will go unaddressed. Finally, though this is more functionality than security, we will not be handling key distribution. The users will need to decide on a shared password in advance. An essential consideration when creating technology is who would potentially be benefited or harmed by the new product. LoraCrypt provides privacy and anonymity in ways that current communication methods fail. These protect the people using technology and allow them to choose what information they want to be publicized. LoraCrypt would provide another option for off-the-grid, secure communication in a time in which such privacy is becoming increasingly limited and difficult to use. There are several populations who would particularly benefit from increased privacy. Privacy protects marginalized groups, since minorities are disproportionately impacted by a lack of privacy. People in countries where civil freedoms are more restricted would be able to communicate across relatively long distances using LoraCrypt. Unlike traditional, unencrypted LoRa, LoraCrypt would provide the security needed for LoRa to be a viable option for avoiding censorship. It has the potential to be more censorship resistant than other communication methods, because, as previously stated, it is decentralized, off-the-grid, and completely anonymous. However, that same off-the-grid communication also has the potential to be used for criminal activities. LoraCrypt could be used to facil facilitate crime, such as terrorism, trafficking, or theft, many of which provide a clear harm to the general population. LoRa also has benefits unrelated to privacy. It's low power, which means it costs less to use. The reduced energy consumption is better for the environment as well. In addition, LoRa works off-grid, which means it doesn't require internet or cell service, 
In places or situations where these are limited, LoRa is a viable alternative. This makes it useful in rural areas, for backpacking in remote locations, or during disasters where infrastructure is compromised. Of course, this could pose some issues. Some of the current benefits of LoRa actually somewhat depend on the fact that it doesn't have heavy traffic. If LoRa becomes too widely adopted, it could cause increased interference in the frequency bounds. It also could lead to increased regulations on radio use. It is important to consider the impact if the technology's security or functionality fails or is compromised. Since the focus of LoRaCrypt is the improved privacy over LoRa, security is of particular concern. If the encryption scheme fails, this could seriously harm the users. As previously mentioned, this would disproportionately affect marginalized groups. Public privacy breaches could also compromise the general public's trust in encryption and online privacy. Security breaches could also provide an opportunity for criminals to collect information on users for impersonation or theft. Of course, in contrast, criminals who used LoraCrypt could be caught if law enforcement found a way to track them through Lora or decrypt their messages. If there are problems with message transmission, that could negatively impact people who have come to rely on Lora. If it does become important for the infrastructure of rural communities, any interference or unreliable ability in transmission could be extremely problematic. It could even pose safety risks if LoRa is used for essential services. All right, I'm going to be giving you a quick demonstration on how to actually use our code. This won't cover setting up the device itself. Check the Git repository if you're interested in that. But once the code is actually on the board, what you're going to want to do is open up some kind of serial monitor. This here is the platform I.O. serial monitor through VS Code, but you can use anything else, Arduino serial monitor, anything that reads and writes serial. What you'll see when you first start up is it'll prompt you to enter a device ID. We're going to initialize this device as 1. And now I'm going to go over to my laptop and set this up as device number 2. So now what we can do is we can type in help and it'll list some of the commands we can use. Notably, uh, we can run list models to see what encryption models are available, which can be easily changed later on. Right now we have default, which is an AES-256 CTR implementation, or none, which is no encryption, which will send raw LoRa packets. Great for debugging. What we're going to want to do is I'm going to show you how to initialize some basic encryption. We're going to run init default, and then we're going to pick a password. We're going to pick something super secure like password. And then we're going to do the same thing on our other device. Once we do this, both devices will have the symmetric key set up and the ciphers will be available to use for sending and receiving. On the second device, I'm going to get ready and type out a receive command. And on my first device, I'm going to send, and then I will pick the destination 2, which is my laptop. And then the model we're going to be using is the default encryption. And I'm going to write a message. I'm going to write, hello, laptop. Now on my laptop, I'm going to hit the receive command, which will open it up for receiving uh, messages. And then I will at the same time send from the computer. And we can see we get our actual message here. A lot of this is just debug information. Uh, this will probably be removed once we push some new code. But you can see that our ultimate message is hello laptop. And it is able to encrypt an arbitrary number of bytes. Um, so you can use it for messages as long as a single packet. Now, we also have the send all and receive all functions. This can be used to send multiple packets. So if you want to send long messages, uh, that is what you'll want to use. All right, and the last thing I'm going to do is give you guys a quick demonstration of our file transfer script. What you can do is you can run Python file transfer, and it'll give you some flags that you can use. Here, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be using, uh, this computer is the sender, so we'll use a dash s. We're going to specify a file location. I have this file already lined up with some super confidential information. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to specify that uh, location with secret message.txt. Our encryption model will be default. And the other device is going to be number two. All right, now I'm going to go over to my laptop. I'm going to do the same exact thing. I'm going to run Python. Uh, here we go. Yeah, Python file transfer. I'm going to use dash r for receiving. And then the same exact command, just swap the device numbers. I'm going to start receiving. And then what I'm going to do over here is I'm going to start sending. And then once it actually recognizes the device, you'll see there's a lot of debug info being printed out. This is basically what is being passed in between devices. And then we just give it a moment to actually find. We see the send has completed successfully. Now we just have to wait for the receiver to properly receive it, which takes a little bit of time. All right, and there we go. We can see that we have our message that suddenly appeared.
we have successfully sent a file over encrypted LoRa channels. And again, this will work with any other type of file. You just have to specify a different file name. Thank you for watching. If you'd like to learn more about anything we talked about, there's going to be a bunch of links in the description, including the link to our Git repository.